I'm going to grab a chair. <clears throat> Luke chapter 15, beginning with verse number 11. Did I bring my notes with me? Oh, there they are. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Luke chapter 15, verse number 11. How are we doing? Is everybody there? Okay. Let's read this story. Luke chapter 15, verse number 11. Jesus continued... There was a man who had two sons. Actually, I want to back up. Let's go to verse number one, and then we're going to go to verse number 11. Chapter 15, verse number one. I want you to see this here. Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus, but the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable, and he tells them three parables, actually, he goes down to verse number 11. Let's do this. Parable of the lost son. This is a parable. He says, Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided the property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he'd spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death? I will sit out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and went back to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick! Bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate. For the son of mine was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to party. Verse number 25. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of his servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come home, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him, but he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours who has squandered your property and prostitutes come home, you kill the fattened calf for him? My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And that is the scripture and the story for today. A couple of things here. There's a movie called Patch Adams. Does anybody ever remember that movie played by Robin Williams? He was the key star in that Robin Williams goes up to this really smart man, and he's trying to get the secrets. And this man says, hold out your fingers. Hold out four fingers. Do you remember this? Hold out four fingers. How many fingers do you see? And do you remember what Patch said? He said, four. And he says, no, 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 no. Look again. How many fingers do you see? And, and he looks, and he kind of crosses his eyes, and he blurs his eyes a little bit. And instead of four fingers, he now sees, do you remember, eight fingers. And he says, I see eight fingers. And he says, ah, oh, that's right. You're looking at the problem, and you have to see beyond the problem and look at the solution if you're going to get the right answer. 
And I'm thinking about that movie clip, and I'm thinking about this particular story, and I want to encourage you. How many of you have ever read or have heard this story before? Show of hands. You've ever read or you've heard this story before? Okay. Pretty much most of us. Lots of people. If all you do is stop and, and think this story is about a prodigal son coming home to be with his father, you have actually missed the entire point of what Jesus is saying. Did you know that? I know, it got really quiet in here. You're only looking at four fingers. Because what Jesus is saying here, and I'm going to share this with you, it's going to really address that instead of just one prodigal son, instead of one lost son, there are two lost sons in this story. There are two lost sons. And this is principle here in this story. And this is, there's so much theology packed in this. I was telling my kids this morning, I was like, oh man, I got to get this sermon down because it's like 25 pages long and I need to bring it down so we're out of here before four o'clock. So there's so much theology in this. But if all you do is stop at the prodigal son, that this story is about some son that goes off and spends his living and he comes home and, and it's like God meeting him and you can come home and you sin and you come back to church and everybody celebrates and everybody throws a party, uh, then you've actually missed the entire point of this story. So we're going to look at what this is about. And to start off here in your notes, in fact, this isn't the first thing, but just you might want to write this down or just keep this in mind as we go through this text. The, the whole principle of two. The whole principle of two in this story, okay? There are two groups of people that are listening to Jesus share this parable. Look in verse 1, if you would, in chapter 15. Now, the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. That's one group. The second group was this. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. So you have tax collectors and sinners, one group. And you have the second group, which is the Pharisees, the religious leaders. You know, the people who have it all right. They know the law. They know the word. They know God. And so you have that group. And then you have the irreligious people, the people that are tax collectors and sinners. So two groups of people listening to this uh, parable. There are two sons found in this story. You have the younger son and you have the older son. Now, here's something that you might want to know. The Pharisees represent the older son in this story. The younger son represents the tax collectors and the sinners. It's the older son who had it all together, who did everything right according to the father, who had it all done right and he worked hard. They represent the Pharisees or the Pharisees represent them. And then the younger son he, they represent the tax collectors and the sinners. They don't have any respect for God. They believe God is dead. They believe that the Father doesn't know best. And they go off and they live life how they want to live. And so two groups of people, two sons in this story. There are two different ways that the sons alienate themselves from the Father. The younger son runs off and the older son takes off and he's out in the field. In the, in the beginning of the story, the younger son is the one that is outside of the Father's house. At the end of the story here, it is the older son that finds himself outside of the father's house. There's two sons. There's two groups of people listening to this. There's two ways that the sons are alienating themselves to God, to the father. There are two ways that the sons are trying to earn the acceptance of the father. If you look at the younger son, the younger son says, when he comes to his senses, do you remember? I'll go back and make myself as one of my father's hired men. He's trying to prove himself to his dad because he doesn't think that he's going to be accepted from the father when he comes home. So he's trying to win the acceptance of his father that way. The older son is trying to win the acceptance of his father by doing everything according to the book. And he says, look, dad, haven't I done all this? And haven't I spent all these years listening to you? So there's two sons, two groups of people listening to Jesus tell this story. There are two ways that the, the sons alienate themselves to the father. There are two different ways that the sons try to earn the father's acceptance back. And there are two different examples of what it means to be lost. First example is when you leave. Second example is a religious person who does everything by the book. Jesus were to say to you, you're lost. And it's very interesting. You don't want to miss this point. Jesus, watch this. Jesus deliberately leaves the story open-ended at the end of the story. There's like a third person that he purposely did not include. 
If you look at, again, in, in Luke 15, there's three parables there. There's the parable of the sheep, the parable of the lost coin, and the parable of the lost son. In the parable of the sheep, the story ends up with the man going out to find the sheep, and he leaves the 99. We know this, right, everybody? He leaves the 99, and he goes after the one and brings them back. In the parable of the lost coin, leaves the house, cleans the house, looks all over for that lost coin, and gets the coin back. But in the parable of the lost son, Jesus leaves it open-ended. He leaves the son and he ends the story with the son, the older son, outside of the house, forced to make a choice. Find that pretty interesting. And we got to make sure that we catch that. It's in the modern mindset here. They couldn't even fathom or comprehend what Jesus was talking about here. Because in the modern Roman mindset, Christianity, they didn't know what Christianity was about. They, They couldn't explain it. They were confused. And that confusion still exists in the church today and in the Christian faith. There are scores of people who think that they know what being a Christian is all about. They are found in the church. They attend all the time. They give money to the church. They study scriptures. They are faithful to come to the house of worship. And just like the older son, they've done everything that God has asked them to do and the Father has asked of them, but they are still on the outside looking in at the church of what God is doing. And they are like the older son. They get angry. They are bitter. They are entitled. And they don't understand what God is doing inside a church. And it's hard for us to realize this today because Christianity and its conception of the religion. In fact, Rome, Christians were commonly known. Did you know this? In Rome, back in this day, Christians were commonly known as atheists. They, they were commonly not associated with the religion. They weren't associated because they didn't follow all the other rules that religions follow. Can you imagine the conversations and the questions that are asked that these people are probably asking the Christians? Like, where's your temple? Where's your temple of worship? And the Christians probably say, we don't really have a temple. We don't have a temple. Well, okay, where's your priest? Where are your priests that do all the labor and they go in the temple and they perform all the services? And can you imagine the Christians' answer? We, we, yeah, we don't have any priests. We don't have any priests at all. Well, where are your sacrifices? You know, because in the Roman world, it was all about sacrifice and animal sacrifice. And you had to make sacrifices to your God. So where are your sacrifices, Christians? Where, where, we don't have to make sacrifices anymore. There's nothing that we have to do. Jesus has done it all. It's powerful, right? So can you imagine all the questions that come up? And and so the modern mindset in the Rome, and even these Pharisees in verse number 1 of chapter 15, they're muttering to themselves, they're complaining, saying, Jesus, who is this man who is hanging out with all these tax collectors and all these sinners? Jesus constantly attracted the irreligious. He constantly attracted the people who were down and out. He constantly attracted the people that messed up, that had huge amounts of sin. He constantly attracted the women that were caught in a certain lifestyle. He constantly attracted the people who took money and the thieves and the, and the people who murdered. He constantly attracted all of these irreligious people and constantly the religious Pharisees were constantly upset at Jesus saying, who is this man that welcomes these sinners into this place? And it's a classic story here in chapter 15, verse number 1, that Jesus, it's out of that complaining, and it's out of that murmuring by the religious people that Jesus goes into the parable of the lost sheep and the lost coin and the lost son. It's out of that that Jesus teaches this principle. So in your notes here, we want to fill these in or else I'll never get through this sermon. The two groups of people gathering around Jesus as he tells this parable. Group one is the religious. It's the Pharisees. It's the religious leaders. Group two is the irreligious, the tax collectors and the sinners. It was after this that Jesus began to teach these different sermons. Let's talk about the first group, the tax collectors and the sinners. These are people who have to find their way on their own. Anybody can relate to that, right? Really, these are the irreligious. These are the people who have no respect 
for the things of God. They're prone to wander off to distant lands and different places. They have a streak of rebellion in them. They are a rebel without a cause. They make really bad decisions. They don't believe that the Father God knows best. They don't believe in the Bible, they, that his plan is best for their lives. They hear that. They hear a preacher preach it, but they don't really believe it. They hear it and they say amen, but when they go out, they don't really believe that God has his best for your life. They're irreligious. They don't care. Much like the younger son, they engage in wild living. They don't adhere to the morals of the Bible uh, or the teachings of the Christian's faith. They are going to do their own thing. It's their way or the highway. They're irreligious. And so much like the younger son, these people take off and they, and, and they live how they want to live regardless of the spiritual consequences. What's interesting about the story is the younger son takes off and he spends everything and he lives a wild lifestyle and he had no regard for who it affected. He didn't realize that it was going to affect his older son. He didn't realize it was going to affect his father, the family's name. He had no idea that his actions were going to destroy a lot of things. He just took off. He's the younger son. And that younger son represents the irreligious. It represents the tax collectors and the sinners. These are the people who go through the streets last night and they and they don't even care. It's all about taking, taking. They don't want anything to do with God. They're never going to come to Claremont Church. They're never going to smile at you. They simply don't care. They're closed off and they just want to go through take and they just want to leave and they'll do it again next year and the year after that and the year after that and they'll spend their entire lives just taking, taking, taking. They're the irreligious. They don't care about God or Jesus. And these are the types of people that Jesus constantly attracted and hung out with. These are the types of people that Jesus will run out to you and hang out with you and just talk with you and love on you and hear your story and say, I know what you're going through and I'm sorry, I love you despite your sin. These are the type of people, the irreligious, that Jesus came to save. He said, the Son of Man has come to save Seek out and to save the religious Pharisees. He said, the Son of Man came to seek and to save who? The lost, the irreligious, the people that are flat out lost. I think as I look at this story and as I'm thinking about me, Jeff, and as you look at this story and you think about you, I think we have something in common with both of these sons. I think and that's wise. I think that's wise to at least admit you know what? I have something in common with this younger son. I've had a re- you know, rebellious side. I have a rebellious streak inside of me. I know some of you do today. I know you're not going to raise your hand and say amen, and that's okay, but you might have a rebellious streak inside of you. We all do. It's called sin. It's called human nature. But we also have something in common with this older son. We're on the outside turning our noses up at the irreligious, at the people who do not believe what we believe. And I think we have things in common. The second group here that Jesus is talking to is the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. These are the people that they think that they are morally superior to everybody else. They hold to the traditions of their upbringing. They love God. They study scripture. They pray to God. They are faithful in the temple. They are faithful in their church attendance. They worship faithfully. And the Pharisees represent this group of people. The Pharisees represent the people who feel like they are entitled to everything around here. They feel like they are entitled. And these are the people who have done everything according to the book. And they have done their best to please God. Remember, the Pharisees thought that they were pleasing God. We can't harp on them too much because they genuinely thought they were pleasing God, the God of the Old Testament. They thought that they were pleasing him. And yet Jesus is saying to these people, you actually are just as lost as the irreligious people, if not more. These are the people that when people come in, new people come in, they turn their nose up at them and say, well, I don't know you. Or you're in my seat. Or what are you doing in my ministry? Or what are you doing leading this? And these are the people that look down at the irreligious and they look down at people who have broken lives. Who are you and what are you doing in here? These are the religious Pharisees that Jesus is addressing. Is it getting really quiet in here? It's pretty quiet, isn't it? Okay. Just want to make sure. Because I'm like stepping on everybody's toes in here, including mine. I understand that. But Jesus is doing it first in Luke chapter 15. So that's number one. Jesus is talking to two different groups of people. The irreligious and the religious. Number two in your notes. Both sons take two different paths in life. 
Chapter 15, verse 13 it says, not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. Somebody say wild living. Wild living. <laughs> Chapter 15, verse 28. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, look. It's almost, can you just see that? I mean, can you imagine the, the older son telling his dad in his own house, look, ooh, very disrespectful thing to do. He says, look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your order. Is there anybody listening to this message that can relate to the younger son? Wild living. You like to go out and do your own thing. Ain't nobody going to tell you how to live, right? <laughs> You're the one that never puts your seatbelt on in the car. You're the one, right? You're the one that is always skipping school. You're the one that when you were a kid, you're sneaking out of the window. You're going out to the market down the street and back before 10 o'clock before mom and dad even notices, right? Don't look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. I know we got wild living people in here. We have it all in us. There's a rebellious streak. So, so Jesus is talking. Both sons take different paths in lives. The prodigal son, the younger son, goes off to a distant country and he spends and he does things that he shouldn't be. You can read the text. He does things that he shouldn't be doing in this wild country. He spends everything he has. You can't take your word for it or your parents' word for it. You're not going to take God's word for it. You have to try it on. Uh, you have to try it yourself. Curiosity killed the cat, right? You're not going to take any instructions from anybody because you know better than your mom and dad and you know better than God and you're going to go out and live a wild life. And that that's the younger son. He takes that path. Now, I want to show you some stuff here in this text, culturally speaking. In this culture, if a father is still living, nowhere is there an estate being divided up. Okay, So a father has to die in this culture if an estate is going to be divided up, much like today. You know, if our parents pass away and if there's anything, you know, if you're in the will, they might give something to you if you've been good. They might give something to you. In this context, if a son or if a father were to die, then the estate is being divided up. Not only that, the older son in this culture, the older son gets two-thirds of whatever the estate or more, two-thirds of whatever the estate is. So he gets the majority of it. And then all the other siblings have to divide up the other amount of the estate. And so for this younger son to come to his dad, who's not dead yet, and say, give me my share of my estate. It's as if he is telling his dad, you're as good as dead to me. You are as good as dead to me and you mean nothing to me. I'm going to go do my own thing and that's just shocking. And nowhere in the Bible, nowhere in this culture would somebody do that. And so for Jesus to share this parable and say that the younger son asked for his share of the estate before the dad is dead, it's totally shocking and mind-boggling, and it's way out of the cultural context. You wouldn't even do that. What's even more shocking is that the oldest child gets two-thirds of the estate. So it, it almost says here that he, it, the, he divides the estate together, almost as if they get 50 50 here. And that's even more shocking because the son, the younger son wouldn't get 50 50. What's even more shocking is that his father even allowed that. His father even gave him the share of estate. Most dads would say, I'm not even dead yet. What are you even talking about? But shocking in this story, the father actually agrees and says, Here you go, son. Praying for you, take off, do your thing. And in the same way, that's a lot, uh, that father in this story really represents God with us. God gives us the freedom of choice. Friend, God gives you the freedom of choice. He gives you, you want to live the life that you want to live? He gives you that freedom. And it breaks his heart because he knows best. And he shows us how to live in this word. He shows us the boundaries that we should live in that are meant to protect us. Not because he's a mean God who sits up in heaven on an anthill and he says, well, you're not going to do this and you're not going to do that. He puts boundaries in our life to protect us. When you go down the I-5 or the 805 or the 15 or any freeway for that matter, there are boundaries. There are dividers. Why? Because, you know, the construction workers want to be mean and they don't want you to stay in just one lane, they want you to go. No, it's to protect you. In the same way, God has put up boundaries to protect you. And the father in this story, he is protecting his younger son, but his younger son wants to go off 
and do his own thing. And so the father in the story represents God the Father. He allows us freedom of choice, and some of our greatest lessons learned will be learned on our own because we have taken off and have done our own thing. And much like the younger son, I don't know about you, but I've, I can relate to this. When we go off and do our own thing and step out of God's will and live life how we want to live life, and we're telling God what he's going to do for us, when we go and live that way, eventually, it might not be today, it might not be tomorrow, eventually we come to our senses and we say, ha, dad was right. Dad was right. God was right. God knows all along what he's doing he knows all along what he's doing in my life. And he has created boundaries in my life. And he's saying no, not right now. Not because he's a mean dad saying no, but because he has your best interest in mind. But just like the younger son, we have to almost hit rock bottom before we understand that. Isn't that true? We almost have to hit rock. Has anybody in here, have, have, have you ever hit rock bottom to where you're like, oh my word, God, I'm so sorry. I'm done doing it my way. I promise I'm going to do it your way. And we go back to God, the Father. That might be you today. Is there anybody listening to this message that relate to the older son? You've done what your parents have asked. You were always the good kid. You were always the one protecting the other siblings, protecting the home, the straight A student. You never got in trouble. You worked hard. You did what was right. Even as an adult, you're still trying to please your parents. You're still trying to win their approval. You want to do everything by the book, exactly how you should do it. You might, you might relate to the older son here, but when your parents show favoritism to the other siblings, you can get upset or you have issues or you feel overlooked that they're looking at other kids and they're looking at my brother and sister and they're overlooking me. You might be able to relate here. Older brothers obey God, though, in this story. Older brothers, the elder brother, he obeys the father to get something, though. He obeys God to get things. And that lets you know that you might relate to the older brother. If all you're doing is coming to church to get something, you might relate to the older brother. If all you're doing is pleasing God to get his blessings, it might be you relate to the older brother here. And Jesus is addressing both types of people. They obey God because it will benefit them. Not because God is worthy of all of our love. Not because he's a great father. But we obey him simply to get things. And if you remember the end of the story here, the elder brother, he says, look, dad, haven't I done all these things? Haven't I done A, B, and C? And, it's, and you haven't even given, here it is, you haven't even given me a goat, and yet you kill the fattened calf for Johnny over here? What's up with that? That exposes the elder son's heart right there when he says, look, dad, you've done all this stuff, and you haven't given me anything. And that's what we know when we relate to the older brother. When we go to God, or we worship God, or we follow God simply to get his power to get his whatever. We got to be careful of that. And that leads us to number three. Both sons here in your notes, both sons alienate themselves from the father. Both sons do that. The older brother represents the religious, but the Pharisees who Jesus is talking to in verse number one and two, that sparked Jesus to do this whole teaching on the parable of the lost son. If you're not careful, listen carefully, friend. If you're not careful, you can attend church for a long time and you can become religious and you can become entitled and instead of welcoming new people into the family of God, you find yourself turning your nose up at it. You might even publicly support it, but privately you're criticizing it because new people coming into the family of God or into the church or into the flock it affects you and it changes your title and it changes your position and that is a control issue. And, and, and publicly you might say, praise the Lord, isn't it wonderful to see so many people in here? Hallelujah, awesome, it's so great. But inwardly, secretly, privately, you're like the older brother. Inwardly, secretly, privately, you're not happy at all about it because you're losing control. You might relate to the older brother and the older brother and the younger brother alienate themselves from the father. Both sons alienate themselves from the father in different ways. The younger son goes off and he wants to be wild and, and to go to Vegas. He wants to take off and go to Vegas and just woo just live it up over there. And the older son stays back at home, did everything what was right, but here's the deal. He became bitter because of it. 
He becomes, he becomes bitter because of it. Some leave God the Father because they were wild. Some leave God the Father because they are angry what, as to what has happened in his house. Some leave the house of God and the church because they're wild. And really, we don't relate. And we are fools. And we believe this book. And we must be stupid. And some people just say, all you Christians, you have, you have nothing in common with me. I'm gone. Some people leave the house of God because of something else that has happened in the house of God. Jealousy has risen up in their hearts. Jealousy and, and criticism, or some people have left the church. I've had people leave the church because they're angry at the pastor, or they're angry at God, or they're angry at other people, and they find themselves outside. Whether you're younger and you leave then, or whether you're older in the faith and you leave because you're upset at somebody else, either way, you still leave and you're alienated from God. And Jesus would turn to both of us, both groups of people, and say, You're both lost, you're both alienated, you're both outside. I remember when I was a teenager, my dad pastored for 30 years. There was one youth pastor I really, really liked. Uh, I went through like five youth pastors in three years. It was like really difficult transition, right? But I attached to all of them. But there was one youth pastor I really, really liked. But something happened behind the scenes, behind the closed doors. I didn't realize what happened. Um, still don't really necessarily, and dad had to let him go. Dad had to fire him and, and no longer was employed. And I was upset at my dad. I remember having a conversation with him in his office and saying, this is the one youth pastor, dad, that I love the most. And I don't understand why you're firing him. And I was upset. I remember going for three to four months just being upset at dad, upset at the church. I didn't want to go to the church. I didn't want to go to the youth group. They were doing a missions trip to Mexico and I didn't want to do it because I was upset that dad had to fire Fire the old youth pastor. And I think back on that, and I, and I think about how that one particular decision alienated me from what God had for me inside the church and from my dad. I remember that. And so I think about this, and I'm applying this to my own life, and I'm thinking about the older brother in my own life. Am I part of the older brother here? And, and I want to point something out here, especially with that story about the youth pastor. Was it the decision that alienated me outside of the church? Was it the decision that dad made that caused me to go outside? The answer is no. It's not the decision that dad made that caused me to be outside the church and be angry. It was the fact that I didn't know how to handle my own anger about that decision that caused me to be alienated outside of the church. In the same way, friend, it really doesn't matter what decision is happening here inside of the church. It's all about your approach to that decision. Thank you, Pastor Lorette. It's all about your reaction and your spirit toward that decision. And I, I, I ask a question. I have a question for all of this. As I was reviewing my notes, I thought, I have never asked this question in a sermon before. I'm going to ask it to you. I have never, ever asked this question to anybody ever in a sermon. And I ask you this today in this setting. What is it that you might disagree with about what we're doing in here at Claremont? And the question is, is it so significant in your mind that you become angry, and alienate yourself from the church? Is it so significant to you? that is it really the decision that bothers you? Or is it the fact that you don't know how to walk in humility? Or you, you just don't know how to handle it? You're like me with that youth pastor. You're just angry at that decision, and it causes you to alienate yourself from the church. And Jesus would say to you, come back home. He would come to you and he would say to you, come back, come back. Because remember, and I'm going to share this here in just a moment, Jesus left to go reach out to both boys. He left the house to reach the son, the younger son. He also left the party to go reach the older son who was outside. And that represents God. He leaves to come out and to reach us. And he leaves to come out and to reach you and to welcome you back home. Number four here. So number three was both sons alienate themselves. Number four, both sons try to earn their acceptance from the father. In verse 19, I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. Make me one of your hired men. Verse 28, the older brother became angry, he refused to go in. His father went out and pleaded with him. And the older son says, look, all these years I've been slaving away. Both approaches to God are wrong. Both approaches to God come up Short. Both approaches to God are incorrect. They will fail every time. And here's good news. We can't prove 
anything to God the Father to get him to love us anymore. I'll say that again if you missed it. I'll bring it home to you. There is nothing you can do to prove yourself to God to make him love you anymore. There's nothing, absolutely nothing. There's nothing you can do because that's a works-based faith. And the crux of the gospel is that God loves us so much and he loves you so much that regardless of the sin in your life, and he is so crazy about you that regardless of what sin you have, whether it's a religious sin, a pride sin, or whether you sinned last night, whether you're sinning right now, it, it does not matter what sin you have. God loves you so much. He knew you were going to sin. He knew that you were going to come up short. He knew that you were going to walk off in wild living. Some of you are like that younger son. You're so far, far away. And God the Father knows that. He knows that you're so far away. He knew you were going to walk away. And yet he loves you so much that he runs out to meet you and he sends his son, Jesus, to pay the penalty, to call you not guilty. The verdict comes back in your life, not guilty. Not because of what you have done, but because Jesus Christ has already done it for you on the cross. That's the crux of the gospel. And Jesus is getting to that as he's sharing this whole parable. And he ends the story and he ends the parable on this. He leaves the elder son outside because we do have a choice whether or not we accept the father's love or not. Remember, the older son was outside and it's like, I can imagine if I was one of the Pharisees or the tax collectors sitting there listening to Jesus, I'd be like, but Jesus, finish the story, right? You, you forgot to finish the story, no, Jesus leaves it open-ended with the elder son outside because the elder son has to make a choice if he's going to receive that free gift of his father, if he's going to join that party that his father is throwing, or if he's going to stay outside the church doors, outside of the house of God, and remain bitter, and remain resentful, and remain upset, and remain entitled. Mm. Jesus addresses that. He leaves it and he gives us a choice. Romans 3.23 says, All have sinned and have fallen short of the glory of God. Here's the essence of what Jesus is saying in your notes. Both the irreligious and the religious are lost. Both sons tried to approve themselves to the father. They both came up short. Both sons tried to earn their acceptance to their father. They both came up short. Both sons had issues. The younger son was wild, didn't think the dad knew best. The older son worked hard and felt like dad owed him something. They both came up short. Both the irreligious, the people who don't care about God or their life, they say that God is dead. They say that God is just, he's not interested in my life. You think that Christianity has it all wrong. and the Christian faith, you're just a bunch of religious nerds, a religious nut. Well, the Bible even says that the gospel is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to those who are being saved, it is the power of God. But both sons, both the irreligious and the religious, are lost. It's the essence of following Jesus. It's not about requirements. It's not about rigorous religious practices. It's not about how good you are. It's not about how well you did this week. That has nothing to do with the Christian faith. That has nothing to do with the gospel. The gospel, the good news, is that God loves you, period. And he showed you his love by running out to meet you and to send you his son, Jesus, to die on the cross for all the things that you've done wrong, all the things that you're doing wrong today, and all the things that you're going to do wrong this week and the following week and next week and next year. Jesus, God, he runs out to meet you, and he sends his son. And he says, I love you so much. I give you my son to pay the penalty for the things that you're doing wrong. That's the gospel. That is the crux of the good news. If you think that the Christian faith is any any more complicated than that, then you myself or you might be lost even yourself if you think the Christianity is more complicated than that. It's not. It's not. The gospel is simple. There's nothing that we can do to earn more or better acceptance from God. God loves us and he sent his son Jesus to die for us. But like the elder son, all of us are outside and we're looking in. What are we going to do? Are we going to accept that free gift? Or are we going to remain bitter? Are we going to remain outside entitled? Are we going to remain saying, you know what? Um, I'm just upset about this. I'm upset that all these people have freedom and I don't. I'm upset that all these people uh, are, are, are being healed and all this and, and I don't. I don't accept that there's a, there's a party going on and yet nobody throws a party for me. 
All these people get recognized over here. Nobody recognizes me. I'm upset. And we alienate ourselves from the church and from God. And so the crux of what Jesus is saying here is that both the religious and the irreligious are lost. It's about a relationship with Jesus. The second thing here is the reason why Jesus left the story how he did, open-ended, was to provide an opportunity for both groups of people, here it is, to change their heart conditions. To change their heart conditions. There's bad news and there's good news here. In this story, there's bad news and there's good news. There's a bad side and there's a good side to this story. Here, there's bad news and good news. I'll give you the bad news here. There's three primary, this isn't in your notes here, but there's kind of three primary indications that you may have an elder brother spirit, okay? There's three primary indications because it's found in this story. Number one is self-righteousness. It leads to a critical judgmental outlook on other people. If you feel like that uh, you're better than everybody else or that you somehow don't have anything in common with sinners and tax collectors and murderers and thieves and prostitutes. If you think that you're above all that, chances are you have a self-righteous spirit. You have an elder brother spirit. And Jesus says, you know what? You're all on the same level playing field here. The second thing is a sense of entitlement. If you have a sense of entitlement and you feel like, you know, God owes you something or that the church owes you something because you've done A, B, and C, you might relate a little bit to the elder brother because he felt entitled. He was outside, and you say, hey, Dad, look, this, this son over here. So if you have a sense of entitlement, you might, you might relate a little bit to the elder brother. And then thirdly here, you're angry or you're bitter over other people getting things and attention that you're not getting. If you're angry or you're bitter about other people, you might relate a little bit to the elder brother. And let me just save you the suspense, okay? All of us probably have some things in common with the younger brother, and all of us probably have some things in common with the older brother. So it's not like you're in here and I'm over here and third row, fifth seat, you're over here, and tenth row, seventh seat, you're over It's not like that. We all have things in common with both of these. Jesus is exposing the fact that the morally superior, the people who think that they're spiritually closer to God, pleasing God, better than their brothers and sisters, Jesus is singling them out in this story, in Luke 15. And he says that their condition of spiritual superiority is a deadly condition. He's saying, Jesus, that they are just as lost, if not more, than the younger ones. The problem with the older son is that he does not see himself as part of the community of sinners. That's the problem with the older son. The problem with the older son is he's outside and he's bitter about people celebrating, you know, singing that song, YMCA. Do you remember that? YMCA, all that. He might be hearing that song. I don't know, who knows? He might be hearing that and he's bitter and he's upset because everybody's partying. And that's, that's, a deadly, that's a deadly spiritual condition. The reality is we are all on level ground. The foot of the cross is level ground. It's all level. Nobody's higher than somebody else. We all need Jesus. We all need forgiveness. That's the bad news. Here's the good news. Jesus left the story open-ended. He ends the story with the elder brother outside looking in. For the Pharisees, the religious leaders, all of the people listening who can relate to the elder brother, the good news is this. We have the power to change our own perspectives and our own outlook and our heart condition. We have the power to change how we view younger brothers. That's a choice. It's a decision. It's an opportunity for you to confess your heart condition. Condition. It's an opportunity for you to confess your prejudices and your judgmental spirit, classifying them as over there and I'm over here. Jesus, the good news is Jesus leaves the brother, the older brother, outside the house so that those Pharisees in verse number one, listening to this, they have an opportunity to respond and change their heart condition toward what the gospel is all about. Number three here, this is the final thing, is it is the father, really want to, I want to end on this, okay? It is the father's intention. He initiates his love to both groups of people. He initiates his love. While he, in verse 20, while he was still a long ways off, his father saw him, was filled with compassion, and ran ran out to his son. If you are relating to the younger son, and you have wandered a long ways off, and you might even be a long ways off, and you're here listening to this message and you've done A, B, and C. And when you walk in here, you feel like an inch tall 
Let me tell you something. God runs out to you and he wraps his arms around you and he welcomes you and he yells back at all of us, kill the fattened calf. Turn on the radio. We're going to have a party. When one sinner rejoices, all of heaven rejoices. When one sinner comes back to the fold, all, all of heaven rejoices. And that's the good news is that if you're a long ways off from God and you've walked away from him, it doesn't matter how far away you have walked. It just takes one step to just turn around and God is right there. He's already run out to meet you in your life. He's not waiting for you to come to church 365 days a year. You better tithe. You better give your money. You better serve. You better dress nice. You better put deodorant on. You better do all this. You better put all these things so God will please you and you'll be accepted in the church. No, 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 no. That's not the gospel. The gospel is all you have to do when you're a long, long ways off is just simply turn around and God the Father is right there waiting for you. It's good news. That's what he's saying. It is the father that initiates his love for both groups of people. Now, if you're the older son, if you're the religious, if you're those people that Jesus is talking about, and that what, what, what we're describing here, and you're religious, and you've done everything by the book, and, and new people are coming to the church, and new people are coming to God, and you're just not too sure if you like this, and you're just not sure. Let me tell you, God runs out to meet you, and he says, all that I have is yours. Just like he told the older son. Son... All that I have is yours. Daughter, all that I have is already yours. Why are you so bitter? Why are you so upset? Why are you out here critical? All that I have and all that I own is yours. And he runs out to meet you. So whether you are the younger son, whether you are the older son, whether you are irreligious today, you really don't care about God, God cares about you. And he's running out to see you. Or whether you are religious and you got everything down by the book and you've done everything properly and in order, yet you find inside you're upset and you're angry and you're critical. Either way, whether you're irreligious or religious, God runs out to meet you. And he says, you have a choice to change a heart. You have a choice. And so my question, and I end this with all of us here today, I'm going to ask the worship team to come up, if you would, please. My question for all of us here today, let's all stand if we would. Mm. My question for you today, are you going to be like the younger son? Runs home, father kills the fattened calf for you, doesn't matter how far you are away. He loves you and he's going to throw a party for you right now. Or are you going to be an older son? How are you going to end Luke chapter 15? That's really what Jesus is doing. How are you going to end Luke chapter 15, this story? Give me the older son, outside, bitter and angry? Or are you going to say, you know what? I have some work to do on my heart. I need to change my outlook. I need to change my ways and how I approach the Father's house and how I approach the Father's people. God loves all of us so much, and we're all welcome in this place. You know that? We're all welcome in this place. All of us, including you. That's good news. That's good news.